What we're going to focus on this morning may be one of the most important messages you ever hear from this pulpit. Not because of any eloquence of the sermon or the preacher, but because of the subject matter about passing on our lives of godliness from one generation on down to the next. What more could be important than, than that? That our lives are passed on to the next generation, that pass on the next generation of godliness, which we need so desperately in our culture today. We have been talking about being legacy changers. We've been looking at the life of Asa, King Asa, King of Judah, who is the great-great-grandson of King David. And he was a legacy changer because he inherited an ungodly legacy, a moral slide of a 60-year period of time that he inherited and made some, some huge reforms because of his courage and his stand for God. We learned that he cut down the idols, the idols that his dad and his granddad and his great-granddad had built and had worshipped in the land. We learned that he deported the cult prostitutes out of the land, completely had them leave to try to make this a more pure place. It tells us that he dethroned even his queen mother because of her immoral stance towards idolatry and cut down her, her idol. And he had incredible courage as, as a king. On top of that, he not only tore things down, but he built things up. He rebuilt the altar of God, that place where people got their hearts and lives right with God, became pure before a holy God. And he rebuilt the altar that had been neglected and, and had decayed over time. On top of that, he made God's house a priority. It had been basically neglected. He made it a priority. He even brought back the gold and the silver and then the various things into it to make it a priority uh, on behalf of God. And then on top of that, he brought all the people together. And he had to make an oath of one heart and, and of one mind to seek after God with everything they had within them. And it says that the people came together and they made this oath and they did so with joy and rejoicing in their heart. He was an incredible reformer. But he was not perfect. And we've talked about how there's not such, a, such thing as a perfect legacy. Every legacy has cracks. Every legacy has dirt in the cracks. Every one, because we're not perfect people. And we have our slip-ups. And Asa had his, his times of slipping up because he became very successful and he became a bit lazy spiritually and he became self-reliant and he made alliances with pagan kings and which messed him up. But God is gracious to him and remembering his legacy is one of godliness overall. So God just doesn't take just one or two blips in the screen that we have done and just says, okay, you don't have a godly legacy. He looked at the totality of Asa's life and he said, this is a godly legacy. And that's why it records in 1 Kings 15, 14, that the heart of Asa was wholly true to the Lord all his days. Even though he messed up at times, overall, all his days, he was a man of God. And then he passes on this legacy to his son, a godly legacy to Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, quite a name, isn't it? And it says about Jehoshaphat that he get this godly legacy from his dad. And it says in 1 Kings 22, verse 43, that he walked in all the ways of Asa, his father. He did not turn aside from it, doing what was right in the sight of the Lord. And he followed in the footsteps of his father Asa. And because of that, he was a godly man and a godly king. Not a perfect man and not a perfect king, but a godly man and a godly king. And I want you to take your Bibles and turn them to 2 Chronicles chapter 17. The 2 Chronicles 17. It's almost halfway through your Old Testament. And if you don't have a Bible with you, we do have Bibles that you can take there and turn it to page 370 and you'll get there. And if you don't own a Bible, we want you to have it. We want you to read it and to be blessed by it. Now we won't take a time to look at a detailed look at, at Jehoshaphat's life um, that's not what the purpose of this morning is about. But I do want to give you at least a picture of his godliness and what he did as king. So look at chapter 17 of 2 Chronicles, beginning in verse 1. Jehoshaphat, his son, Asa's son, reigned in his place and strengthened himself against Israel. Remember, Israel's the northern kingdom, Judah's the southern kingdom. He placed forces in all the fortified cities of Judah and set garrisons in the land of Judah and in the cities of Ephraim that Asa, his father, had captured. The Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he walked 
in the earlier ways of his father, David. Actually, that's his great, great grandfather, very godly king. He did not seek the Baals, but sought the God of his father and walked in his commandments and not according to the practices of Israel. Therefore, the Lord established the kingdom in his hand and all Judah brought tribute to Jehoshaphat and he had great riches and honor. His heart was courageous in the ways of the Lord. And furthermore, he took the high places and the ashram, the, the, the idols, out of Judah. In the third year of his reign, he sent his officials, ben Hale, Obadiah, Zechariah, Nath- Nathanael, and Me- something like that, to, <laughs> to teach in the cities of Judah, and with them the Levites, and then a whole bunch of guys. Verse 8. <laughs> and we'll just get to verse 9. And they taught in Judah, having the book of the law of the Lord with them. They went about through all the cities of Judah and taught among the people. So Jehoshaphat goes a step farther than his father Asa did. Asa had a lot of great reforms, but, but Jehoshaphat goes one step further. Not only does he continue to tear down the, the idols that aren't supposed to be there, but on top of that, he has the godly uh, priests and, and leaders to go about the the. the country of Judah and to teach the law of God and the ways of God and about the majesty of God. He has them go systematically teaching the people about who God is. He's a godly king and he's a courageous king and he seeks the Lord and he teaches the people about God. And one of my favorite parts of the story of Jehoshaphat, although he too was involved with the sins of his father. He too made alliances with pagan kings, like dad, like son. He had an army that coming after him. It was a huge army that was after him. Sound familiar? Asa had a huge army from Ethiopia that came up. And now Jehoshaphat has the same issue that's coming upon him. And what does he do? He gathers the people together to, to pray and to seek the Lord because he's way outnumbered, way outmanned, way outweaponed. He's in trouble. And so together they seek the Lord and he prays in front of the people to God for help. And in that prayer is this line that I think we should all hold on to. He said in that prayer to God, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Boy, isn't that an important prayer. So this last week when I was speaking at our staff chapel I had cards made for our staff. As I was studying this, I wanted to share this with them. And it simply says, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. So that's so much of, of, of us at Mission Hills. We don't, we don't know what to do a lot of the times, but our eyes are on you. Personally, a lot of times we don't know what to do, but God, our eyes are on you. This is the kind of man that Jehoshaphat was. And what we want to look at today is how do you pass on a godly legacy to the next generation? How do you do it? And I'm going to give us four musts. I'm not sure what good English that is, but four musts. Four things we must do in order to pass on a godly legacy to the next generation. The first thing that we must do to pass on a godly legacy is that you must start with yourself. You must start with yourself With a godly legacy, you must seek God above all else that we learned last weekend. First and foremost, you must start with yourself. You you can't start with somebody else. you got to start with yourself if you're going to pass on a godly legacy. Uh, The the late Howard Hendricks used to always say, you cannot impart what you do not possess. You cannot give away what you do not have. If you don't have a deep love for God, you can't give it away to somebody else. If you don't have a generous heart to the things of God, you can't teach others to have a generous heart toward him. If you, don't have, if you don't have a deep love for the word of God, you're not going to pass that on to the next generation. If, you, if you're not a person of prayer, you're not going to pass on a prayer life to the next generation. You cannot impart what you do not possess. You can't give away what you don't have yourself. You've got to start with yourself and your own Lord and, and, your, and your own life and to seek the Lord, to rely upon God above all else. Because as goes the leader, so goes the follower, Spiritually. As you lead, so goes those who follow you spiritually. And I don't know if you've noticed this. You know, we have four kids. The next generation is watching you closely. They want to see if what you say matches with what you do. Have you noticed that? 
They, they want to make sure that when you say don't do this, that you're not doing it. Or do this, that you are doing it. In fact, you know what young people want more than anything else? They want authenticity in adults. They want the real deal. And they're going to see if your life, if your life squares up. And if it doesn't square up, why should they do it? You've got to start with yourself before you go anywhere else with this. The second must to pass on a godly legacy is that you must make that your highest priority. You must make passing on this legacy your highest priority. It can't be a secondary priority or a third level priority. It's got to be a first level top priority in your life and what you live. Or it's not going to happen. So many of you in this room are, are very career oriented. You have great careers. Some of you are incredibly busy. I'm, I am at a place in my own life where I have more demands upon my time than I've ever had in my entire life. And my kids would tell you that. And they let me know that from time to time. Appropriately so. And I need to say to any of us that are in a career grind of one form or another ministry or not, that you've got to make the legacy building a very high priority, which means you've got to diminish the career priority. Just so you're around, just so you're home. Some of you travel a tremendous amount, and maybe that's the only way that it can happen for you, and I understand that if that's the case. But for some of you, you could change that and not travel as much or maybe take a demotion or, or, or maybe a different job altogether or not take a promotion so you won't have to travel as much so that you can just be present more and, and, make, and make that a high priority to be around and to pour your life in to your family. Some of you uh, are really into the bucket list thing and you have this bucket list and you have all these things that you want to accomplish in your life and you want to skydive and that's never going to be on my bucket list. And, and, and you want to go to Europe, and you, you want to go to a, a Super Bowl, and you want to you know, go, go to this and that, and you got this bucket list, and, the, and you're working on it and pursuing it. And for some, that becomes a bigger pursuit than building a legacy of godliness. And a lot of people just kind of haphazardly you know, tr try to, to, to hope that their, their life rubs off on their kids, and then that'll be enough. With no plan or no, or no focus on that. A few years ago, a number of years ago now, I was up in the mountains and I was doing some planning for Mission Hills and I was trying to come up with a few goals and at that time I was thinking, okay, well, what should Mission Hills be down the road and therefore, okay, what goals do we need to set and steps do we need to take to get there? And while I was doing that, sitting there next to this beautiful stream, I had this thought, like, why don't I ever do that with my family? Why don't I just do that with the church? And so I begin to write down specific goals for our kids of how we could train them in, in godliness. And then I came back and Jane and I worked on it together and we prayed about it and then we even revised it. And we came up with, with this list. We call it Rom Romberger Family Goals. It doesn't, doesn't mean that we're going to have perfect kids because of it. But at least there's some kind of a intentionality as parents in building a, a godly legacy. So here's, here's what we came up with. And you don't have to come up with a list like this, but come up with something for, for your own family. Uh, the first category was spiritual. And that we want our kids to be followers of Jesus Christ. That was number one on our list. And we put under that developing a heart of worship, being a lover of his word, uh, developing a heart of service. So that was important to us that they serve we put in there to have a heart for missions, global and local. And, and so that's why we take our kids when they get into high school on a separate missions trip with mom and dad. That's why we have missionaries in our home. That's why we encourage them to go on mission trips. Uh, we put on there to be generous and support God's work. And that's a part of when they get money, that part of it goes to the Lord's work and to his church. That's just part and parcel of, of what it means to be a part of our house. We have a category of educational. Um, to be readers more than watchers of TV which in the summertime is incredibly challenging. And then we put to be college graduates. Now, if they don't have a college a bent, that's fine, but we need to be prepared as parents to try to provide for that if possible. We, we have a standard of always striving to do their best, developing good study habits, things like that. Then we have a category of physical, physical and emotional. And we put down here to stay sexually pure, saving themselves for marriage. You gotta talk about that. You gotta set that standard. 
and, and it needs to be important to you as a family. We put down to make healthy choices like eating and snacking, exercise, what they listen to, what they watch on, on, on uh, you know, TV and in movies and music and things like that. You know, we're, we're the, the weird family. Our kids tell us that from time to time, you know, that we're stricter than, than so many of their, of their friends and their, their families. And it's like, you know, they get pushed and like, man, your parents are like weird, you know. And I'm like, I'm good with that. I'm good with, uh, you know, because I really, I love their friends, but I really don't care what they think. Because we're, we're raising these kids. We're not raising them. And, and I really am not all that concerned about what their kids, what their friends think about, about what we do. Because we're responsible for our own kids. And, and to buck the trends out there of hey, this is okay to watch, and this is okay to listen to, and this is okay to go to. A lot of that stuff's not. It's just not. Okay, I'll get off of that. And... A relational, we put down to marry a godly person who adores and respects them, to be able to interact respectfully and appropriately with adults, to develop and maintain healthy friendships. So th that's, that's our list. And it just helped us not to develop, like I said, perfect kids, but we, we as parents have some intentionality in what we want to build into our kids and to help them become godly instead of just hoping it happens somehow. You know, one of the things that has been the most helpful for, for me as a dad is bedtime. Not my own bedtime, but their bedtime. Uh, you know, Jane's been with them all day, and then it's time for bed, and Jane's all, you take them and put them to bed. And uh, even though we have two are out of the house now, and now we have one in high school, one in junior high, still a part of bedtime. And, and when they were kids, little kids, boy, that, that could be an hour, an hour and a half with four kids spreading out, you know, when they went to bed. And, and there's something about laying on a bed with your kid, reading, uh, praying, talking about their day in the dark when they just, their hearts just open up. And I've spent a lot of my life laying in bed next to my kids, hearing their heart and talking to them. And talking to them about the things of the Lord at times. Not always, but building into them the things of God even right before they go to bed and praying for them before they go to sleep. you got to make it a high priority or it's not going to happen. The third must on my heart is to pass on a godly legacy, you must take an uncompromising stand. you got to have courage in doing this. Even after the last few services, talking to people, my goodness, some of the courage that people are, are doing to, to stand strong for the Lord is incredible. To take an uncompromising stand. Courage is willing to do what needs to be done regardless. And, and we have seen Asa, and now we have seen Jehoshaphat take strong stands. I mean, think about Asa, who undid what had been done for decades, tearing down places of worship that were sacred to people, undoing the practices of the temple, tearing down and building up. It's going to take some strong stands and uncompromising stands to do that. And it won't be easy. And you're going to need the help of God to do so. We looked at in week two of this series of, of what Asa tore down. And he tore down a legacy of sexual perversion. And he tore down a legacy of idol worship. And he tore down a legacy of ungodly domineering family leadership. And he had the guts to do it. Even when no doubt it was very unpopular with the people who were closest to him. Including dethroning his mother. There must be great courage in taking an uncompromising stand for the next generation. Because every generation seems to slip more and more and more. And if we slip with it, the next generation is going to slip all the more. I'm not talking about rigidity. I'm not talking about legalism. I'm talking about uncompromising to the truth that's in the word of God. The fourth must. To pass on a godly legacy, you must pray for God's power. You must pray for God's power. Why? Because you can't change a heart and I can't change a heart. You can't change a legacy. I can't change a legacy. But God can. God can change a heart, and God can change an entire family system. God can change a family through his power. He can soften hearts. 
He can free people from addictions. He can change a mindset. He can take somebody who's totally against him now to be a follower of his and a child of his. God can do that through his power and the power of the Holy Spirit. And without prayer and seeking God and asking for him to infiltrate these lives, sometimes it'll never be done. You hear these great stories of these grandmothers and great-grandmothers who've been praying for kids for, for decades upon decades and finally God gets a hold of a life. But we need to be reminded of the truth that every person stands before God on their own. No matter what legacy they've inherited, godly or ungodly. Each person stands upon their own. And you can be a great parent and you can be a godly parent and you can pour yourself into your kid with everything that is right and pure and your kid walks away from God. And there's not a thing you can do about that, but you can pray. You can ask for God to intervene and God to infiltrate that life and make a difference and a change in that person because you can't do it on your own. A week ago Thursday in this room, we had a one-day conference uh, for pastors and spouses and they came from all over Colorado and some even flew in from other areas. It was put on by Daniel Henderson, our prayer pastor and his national ministry of prayer. And... Uh, we had hundreds of pastors here and their spouses. And the two main speakers were Daniel Henderson and then Jim Cimbala. Jim Cimbala is pastor of Brooklyn Tabernacle in Brooklyn, New York. Um, his story is an amazing story where um, <clears throat> he grew up in Brooklyn. He's, he's white and yet his church is predominantly African American. Uh, when he started pastoring the church, there was about 15 people in the church. Now on a Sunday, there's over 10,000. You've probably heard of their choir, the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir. They've had six Grammy Awards now. They sang recently a year ago at the presidential inauguration. They were amazing. And, and it's a church on the, on the front lines. And Pastor Jim and his wife Carol have a daughter named Chrissy. And she went wayward for two and a half years and a week and a half ago when he was here and speaking to the pastors, he shared, he felt led at the end of his, his last talk to, to talk about the story of, of Chrissy. And it's so appropriate for, for what we're talking about that I want you to see it as well. <clears throat> now you need to know a few things like um, when he talks about a prayer meeting at his church, the prayer meetings at, at Brooklyn Tabernacle are on Tuesday nights, and there's 2,500 to 3,000 people who go to these prayer gatherings. You'll see him, and he, he walks down in the shadows. This isn't like great video because, uh, you know, he wasn't worried about video, but, but just focus on his words. And then at the end, he's going to pray a powerful prayer for families who have wayward kids or grandkids. And he's, he's going to tell the pastors, stand up, and he's going to tell them to come forward. And I want to say, let Pastor Jim be our pastor to, to finalize this this sermon, and this series. And so if you are a person that should stand because you have a kid that you're concerned about spiritually or grandkid, when he says stand, go ahead and stand. <clears throat> he also tells them to come forward. You can come forward if you want. You don't have to. You can just stay standing, whatever you feel comfortable with. In all services, we have had people come forward, but that's up to you, however you want to do that. But he's going to be the one to, to close out our, our sermon today. And so let's... Let's watch. Someone started crying here when I mentioned my daughter. I happened to see your face. So that tells me that maybe I should leave on this note. You know, when I went through that two and a half year long nightmare with my daughter, I said this at dinner last night. One night at my lowest, my wife had a hysterectomy during that time. Hormonally, she got thrown off, estrogen levels. She started talking of not wanting to live anymore and taking her life. I'm pastoring a church, starting other churches, renting Radio City Music Hall. My daughter's not there. I cried through Christmas Eve. It's not easy. The Lord one night at about 1 o'clock in the morning, 1.30 on a Saturday night as I was praying, said, I'm going to bring Chrissy back. He had stopped me talking to her for months and just said, you've tried manipulation, money. You know, when your daughter's drifting, you try to fix it. Do I get a witness here? You try to fix it. 
right? But God, you know, the, wor the harder I tried, the worse she got. I tried everything. Carol was going through her struggles. I thought I was going to lose my mind at times, the grief of Chrissy, then my wife, not the woman I married any longer. After not talking to her for five months, knew she was in the city at this time in a Tuesday night prayer meeting. Someone sent a note up and said, I feel impressed. We're supposed to pray for your daughter tonight. I waited, called an associate pastor at the appropriate moment, had him lead out in prayer. The church turned into a labor room. Ever been in a labor room? You know, their love for me, for Carol, their love for Chrissy, the Holy Spirit helping them. I didn't shed many tears that night because all my tear ducts were dry. You, know, you cry so much, there's nothing left. I came home, my wife wasn't there, I came home, she was sitting at the kitchen table, she had a cup of coffee, I sat there, she said, how'd the day go? I said, it's over, Carol. She said, what's over? I said, it's over, Chrissy's coming back. She said, how do you know? I said, if there's a God in heaven, she's coming back. If you were there and heard them pray, it's over. Just about the next morning, I'm shaving, Carol bursts in the bathroom. She says, Chrissy's downstairs. I wiped the shaving cream off. Wait, I wiped the shaving. That means time out. Uh, I wiped the shaving cream off my, eye, uh, off my face. I go downstairs, and there's my beautiful daughter, model child grown up. She's on her hands and her knees, crying. I lift her up to me. The minute I saw her eyes, I knew she had changed. She was the girl that I remember. She said, Daddy, I've sinned against God. I've sinned against you. I've sinned against Mommy. I've sinned against myself. Who'd you have praying for me last night? I said, what do you mean, Chrissy? She said, just tell me, who'd you have praying for me? Well, we did pray for you. The church prayed for you. She said, because in the middle of the night, God gave me a dream, a vision. I saw myself going 95 miles an hour toward this abyss, and he caught me right on the edge. And instead of yelling at me, Daddy, he loved me, and he said he still cared for me, and he had a plan for my life. And now she's the wife of a pastor in Chicago, doing great work for the Lord, got the same gifting her mother has. Not trained, not trained, not trained, doesn't know what she's doing. She just keeps doing it every Sunday like my wife. God recovers stolen property. Here's one thing the Lord, I felt, say to me. Wherever I send you, where you feel prompted, you tell them what I did for your daughter. You tell them, I'm going to make you an example that God does answer prayer. Let's close our eyes quick. If you're here, you got a daughter, son, granddaughter, grandson in trouble. Away from the Lord. You know they're not where they need to be. I don't need to know the details. Just stand right now. You got a son or a daughter, grandson or granddaughter you're concerned about. Stand up. Walk up here quick. Come on. Maybe you dedicated your baby to the Lord like I did Chrissy. And I got to the place in, in prayer where I said, God, over my dead body, is the enemy going to have Chrissy? No, 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 God, you're going to recover a stolen property. He's able to keep that which we commit to him against that day. Father, I bring our sons before you. I bring our daughters. What you did for my Chrissy, would you do it again, Lord? Do it again so your name might be glorified. 
You told me to share this where it's appropriate. I never have forgotten your faithfulness. Chrissy is a trophy of your grace and answer to prayer. And we believe that you are going to bring our daughters back from the east, from the west, from the north, from the south. We don't care what they're involved with, who they're with. You're stronger than all of it. You're stronger than all of it. You're stronger than all of it. Our sons too. Whatever they're in prison, it doesn't matter. You can reach them in prison like you did Harold, Greg. We don't care what lifestyle they're in, you're stronger than the lifestyle. What drug, you're stronger than the drug. How hard and callous they are, you're, you can break the hardest stone, Lord, and make it soft. So that's what we ask you to do. Bring back a song they once heard. Bring back a verse we once told them about. Bring back a sermon they once heard in church. Send somebody to them. Send some people away from them that are polluting their minds, Lord. Whatever has to happen, we take our hands off of it. We'll do what we can do, Lord, humanly. But you seem to be saying to us, give it to me and see what I will do. So we're not going to worry or fret or be anxious. We're just going to hold this before you. Until we see the answer, we're going to believe and worship you. And Lord, you remember that night? where you impressed upon me, do you believe I'm bringing Chrissy back? And I said to you in that chair in my living room, yes, I do believe it. And you spoke, then stand up and worship me for what I'm going to do in your daughter. And I thought, how could I do that? I haven't seen her back yet. And you said, no, you have to praise me before you see it. Because that's the worship that means the most to you. So we lift our hands up to you. Come on, let's do it. Moms and dads and grandparents. We bring before you grandsons and granddaughters, those who have a calling on their life to ministry and missionary work and other good things in music and teaching children, Lord. We give them all to you today in the name of Christ. On this day, Thursday, in Denver, Colorado, we make a transaction with the living God. In the name of Christ, his son, we come in that authority and power and access only through the blood and the cross of Christ. And we ask you not for a new car or, Lord, for a new house. We ask you for our sons and daughters to be worshiping next to us. That's what we ask for. That's what we ask so that your name might be glorified and praised. We ask all of this in Jesus' name, in the matchless name of Jesus. And everybody said,